All right, thank you very much um, for inviting me to come and speak. I'm doing two talks this afternoon, so I apologise if you get a bit sick of me um, talking, but anyway, I was just invited to come, so that's what I'm going to do. I thought the first talk that I do now is to talk about the guidelines that we've just um, developed and now finished, uh, which we're quite proud of. Um, and I thought it might be quite nice to get those out there before we then move on to the more sort of nitty gritty of psychological or more sort of um, people aspects, I guess, of bariatric surgery. So you probably know about, I don't know if you know about these already, but these are some guidelines that we were developing, which were asked by BOMS um, to put together. Um, and they look at how to support people psychologically before and after surgery. So I thought I'd just today take you through what we've done and then the final guidelines and what they are, and they're about service delivery. Um, we were originally asked by BOMS to pull them together, but we've just found out that if so, have endorsed them as well, which is really nice. So we're quite proud about that and hoping they give us their logo, which we haven't quite got yet. But <laughs> if they give us our logo, then it becomes kind of official that they are in endorsed. Um, so just to, I, mean, I know I'm speaking to the room of the converted really here, so just to talk to you through why psychology is important um, in terms of bariatric surgery. Clearly the patients that come in um, for surgery have lots and lots of potential psychological issues in terms of their future after surgery, but also in terms of um, the histories before they actually get there. So they have complex psychological histories, issue, issues around binge eating or depression or anxiety or whatever it is that's been part of their world before they've come to surgery. Not all of them. I mean, some of them don't and some of them do, but some of them have quite complex histories. Some of them show positive psychological outcomes. In fact, quite a lot of them do after surgery. So they show um, improvements in well-being and reduction in depression and anxiety and uh, reduction in binge eating as well after surgery. But some of them show poorer outcomes. And so that's where some of the problems lie. Um, so things can get worse, uh, whether they lose weight or not, some of them can show poorer psychological outcomes. And I'll be talking in my other talk a bit more about weight regain and what that's about and how that links to kind of poorer psychological outcomes. Some of them show poor weight loss uh, in the first place and some of them show weight regain as well, which might be linked to psychological issues, some of which happen after surgery and have, some of which were there already before surgery. So even if you're not a psychologist, it's quite clear that there's sort of lots and lots of psychological issues there wrapped up around the process of having bariatric surgery. So it's been generally accepted now uh, in the literature that patients should be managed by an MDT, which should involve some kind of psychological support. But there is a problem, um, and this is where our kind of guidelines sat really, was within that problem is that there's huge variability between existing services and there's issues around patient safety, patient outcomes and trying to develop quality pathways. So it seemed to us that we needed some sort of guidelines to systematise how psychological support was being delivered or to at least make recommendations. And there are current BOMS guidelines out there already for other aspects of care. Um, there's nutritional guidelines and there's guidelines around clinical services. We've got no UK guidelines for psychological support, but there are EASO guidelines post-surgery and there's also ASMBS um, guidelines pre-surgery. But there's nothing in the UK and there's nothing for the UK before and after surgery. Um, there's also NICE guidelines, which are pretty vague, really, and just say there should be something to do with psychological support for patients, but it doesn't say what that is or how that should be administered or when or what it might look like. So we were approached by BOMS um, in September 2018 um, at the IFSO conference in, where was it, London? Was it in London? I think it was in London. Um, and they asked us to pull something together. So I gave a talk there and they came up to me and Denise was there as well. Um, so we decided to pull something together, which was a good thing for us to be able to do really. And so we were aware that setting this up uh, was going to create various different tensions and also that there were kind of existing tensions out there in terms of how much psychological support people should have, um, how much that was going to cost, when it should be, what it should look like. Um, though, so these were the sort of the tensions that we were sort of having to deal with really. Um, and when we presented it at the BOMS conference afterwards, it was quite clear that there were sort of different perspectives, obviously between surgeons and psychologists or 
dietitians as to what that might be. So the first problem is that the evidence out there is not great. Um, there's not huge amounts of evidence for what psychological supports would be, whether it should be effect whether it is effective, when it should be delivered, and there's lots of mixed evidence around the role of baseline problems predicting later problems or whether those actually get worse or they get better by having surgery. So the evidence base isn't great. Um, also, we've all got different perspectives. So, you know, I'm a psychologist and mostly, not always, it has to be said, mostly I think psychology is a good thing because <laughs> I am a psychologist, so I have a perspective. Um, surgeons have different perspectives and they believe in cutting things out. Uh, we believe in talking um, and the biological perspective. You know, I've been to talks at bombs by endocrinologists and people who are big fans of medical perspectives and giving people medication. So they have their own beliefs about what might work and also patients have their own beliefs about what might work. Um, so we're all kind of slightly clashing. I mean, you know, it's, it's great that the conferences, people come together, but there's lots of different perspectives on what, what is good for patients and what patients need. And also what patients think they need isn't always what they really need or what psychologists think patients need isn't what actually works. So you might you have a view on something. It doesn't mean to say it's effective. Um, so it was looking, kind of dealing with all those different tensions as well. And then also in terms of service delivery, you know, we could set a blue sky model for what a service would look like, but actually there's no money out there. If you're working within the NHS, you've got the straight constraints of finance, financial constraints. It's not going to happen really. Um, and then also you've got private practice where you can ask for more money, um, but then patients aren't necessarily going to pay it. And then you have to make decisions of whether it's an opt-in or, or an opt-out kind of service that you deliver and you know what the issues of that are. So it's hugely varied. And then also we were really aware when we talked to people, particularly within the bombs world, that when you use the word guidelines, everyone slightly panics <laughs> and thinks you're going to tell people what they should be doing. Um, I mean, I'm an academic. I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> uh, I certainly don't like to be told what to do. And I suspect surgeons like it even, well, as little as the rest of us do. So there was definitely a tension around what was our guidelines going to be? Were they going to be prescriptive or were they going to be advisory, really? So that was the kind of the context to it as well. So what we decided to do was to do our best, really, and to develop guidelines, pre and post guidelines for patients um, having surgery to pitch ourselves somewhere between a blue sky model, which wasn't going to be feasible and never was going to get delivered by anybody, to something that was a bit too pointless really and wasn't going to, you know, wasn't going to add anything to the existing system, but to recognise that that's, we were doing a sort of pragmatic approach. It was going to be flexible because there's loads of different patients out there with loads of different needs and there's loads of different services with different structures and there's loads of different access to funding. So it was going to have to be flexible, it was going to work. We were going to work at patient safety and having a quality pathway and we were trying our best to try and you know please everybody I guess and match different kind of perspectives. So have that to kind of work. So this is what we did. So I thought I'd just take you through how we did it. Um, there were different stages. We reviewed the evidence. We had expert input. So these were developed by myself. So I'm an academic um, health psychologist. So I do research. That's what I do. I don't see patients. I'm not clinically qualified. Um, I do research and I teach. So I'm aware of the academic background to it. And then we had Denise Ratcliffe and Vanessa Snowden Carr, who I'm sure you're aware of, who are both clinical psychologists who have worked in bariatric services for a long, long time and have got lots of real life patient experience and are very much aware of you know, working in the NHS, but also working in the private sector um, and the constraints that both those systems place upon them, but also you know, the reality of working with patients. Um, and then we got lots of feedback. So we developed a thing, which we then sent out to feedback. We sent it, to, we presented it at bombs and we got feedback from the floor. Someone here, where are they, was saying that they were there. They did that. We sent around our notes and people filled in their notes and told us what they thought about it. Um, and then we had a discussion, a floor discussion where, I can't remember who it was, someone was quite aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember who that was, uh, but most people weren't. Um, then we went, we went to the special interest group where we got feedback from them and also we got feedback from um, service users as well. So we had everyone's different perspectives. It went through various iterations, it went to BOMS Council, we then presented it to the ASO, we got further feedback from there and then a couple of weeks ago it was presented to IFSO and they had a vote and they decided to adopt it. 
Um, so just to take you through those different stages, the evidence base, we did a review of the evidence um, and we looked at psychological assessment pre-surgery, pre and post-surgery, and then the specific psychological issues. So we've actually pulled together three reviews of the literature. They are brief literature reviews, they're not systematic reviews. Um, we were trying to kind of map, map out what literature was there um, to have a look what the gaps were and see if we could make any kind of sensible conclusions really. And the conclusions were the evidence was not great, it's a bit mixed, quite inconclusive. Um, and that in terms of pre-surgical assessment, it had lots of different roles. So that was all a bit problematic. We couldn't really decide what that should be, but it could be to exclude patients, it could be to provide psychological intervention, or it could be to monitor or to educate. Um, in terms of psychological support, it could address mental health issues, but it could also be psychoeducational. It could be delivered by qualified mental health professionals, or we could upskill existing health professionals already working in the bariatric surgery. And also that different mental health issues require different types of support. I mean, the word which keeps coming up is different. <laughs> so different patients, different needs, different mental health problems, different timing, different, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's a mixed old bag, really, that we're trying to deal with. From the expert meeting, the three of us got together and I told them about the evidence base, which was kind of that. And then they told me the reality of what it's like to run a service. Um, and we, we brainstormed what that service might look like. And the pair of them drew upon their years and years of clinical experience and dealing with patients and setting up services and what might work and what might not work. Um, the feedback that we got from our different sources basically said, no one size fits all, I suppose, for everything across the board. There's variation between patients, variation between services. People were very keen on the idea of upskilling, um, which is a you know a very interesting idea, but also slightly contentious because people are a little bit um, you know possessive of their roles. You know, do we upskill everybody to do everything, or you know, how much training do you need to be able to do what a clinical psychologist does, or what add-ons would there be? So, but people are keen on upskilling. Whole issues around funding, just saying it's not going to happen. We've got no money. Um, the need for us to be realistic, um, and I think the surgeons particularly were kind of our feedback to them was we need to still carry on with our. If you tell us that things are going to be have to be too good, we won't be able to do that. Um, and then we will fall short all the time. And I think that's what their fear was, that if we set the standards too high, there would always be a gap, and then they would look like they were not achieving or not performing as a service. Um, so they wanted us to be very realistic about what was feasible, really, within the constraints of service delivery. Whole issues around timing. Um, patients want everything sooner. They want everything, really, all the time and sooner. So they just want more and more and sooner. Um, and then you know whether you, you can't obviously do that for everybody um, and then whether you support people before and after and then when after and then how long it goes on for all those kind of issues and then just something around sharing resources so this is what we came up with we've got some underpinning principles um, which are supposed to be guiding our guidelines it's a living document so absolutely aware that this is not the end product this is a work in progress so it's a living document we've got a blog which is a live blog where people can feed back their experiences as they try to use it and then it can be modified over time it's supposed to be flexible and pragmatic so you you know hopefully no one will feel like they're failing because they can't do it so it's supposed to be something which will be flexible to fit in to however services are going to be run it's advisory not prescriptive which everyone was relieved about um, not that we could be prescripted anyway but you know we were saying we recommend this and that's the way it is it was broad and it was skills based delivery so what it was was we would like to have psychology in all services and psychology in the broadest sense so that's some sort of psychological support for people dealing with some sort of psychological issues but in the broadest sense it's a step care model um, which Denise and Vanessa have worked with before and recommend it's a good way of managing things. So there's three, se three steps. Step one is online resources, step two is group workshops and step three is one-to-one -one support. Patients go through the pathway depending on what their needs are. If they're fine, they just have online resources. If a bit of group workshop would help them, then that's where they go to. If they have specific mental health issues, then they get one-to-one -one support. So it's a, you know, it isn't a one-size-fits-all, it's a very much a kind of variable uh, process. 
and people should be seen in some way or another pre-surgery and then post-surgery between six to nine months. Um, and so that's that really, some sort of triage before surgery and then afterwards they get flagged up, seen again, six to nine months and then you carry on offering them support of some sort. And this is it. So it's all been uh, published in a paper now in Clinical Obesity and it's available for downloading from the BOMS website. Um, so it's there and the BOMS website's got this which you can just have so that's free access if you can't get the journal um, and also it's got links to the blog as well so you can then shout rubbish at us anonymously from a distance <laughs> if that's what you want to do please don't do that <laughs> um, but actually I don't know how you anonymously comment on a blog but um, you can probably find ways if that's what you want so pre-op some kind of triage post-op issued identified where do you belong and then you go into your step one two three um, and then patients fit really where they should be fit and then there's a literature attached to this which tells you what kinds of things should send a patient here here and here and what the evidence is for that and so there's a lot more detail as to how you go through the different steps um, and then whether you end up with a one-to-one -one with a clinical psychologist or not. I mean, what it means is that not every patient has a one-to-one -one with a clinical psychologist. They have other kind of forms of psychological support, uh, which varies according to what their needs are, but that that's still there as an endpoint if that's what people need. Um, I mean, interestingly, to reflect on the process, because I'm not a clinical psychologist, I was probably less keen on everyone seeing a clinical psychologist than Denise and, and Vanessa were, so that was a sort of slight tension between us. So I guess this sort of slightly reflects real-world variability as well, really. Um, so they, as psychologists, I think we tend, as clinical psychologists, I've got two sitting down the front here, clinical psychologists see people who need clinical psychologists, therefore they think everyone needs a clinical psychologist. In some ways, it becomes a slightly self-fulfilling thing because that's their, their caseload, whereas from the outside, the evidence doesn't necessarily support that everyone needs to see that. But anyway, that's the process that we go through. Um, so that's it, it's done. What's left now is a huge amount of work that we need somebody out there to fund and do and you know make us some resources really. So there needs to be something around what happens pre-surgery um, in some kind of triage process, perhaps a consensus or not. We also would love some lovely online resources that somebody out there needs to develop. Um, I know that there's stuff out there already, but it would be great to have that pulled so that we could have, this is what patients can read before and after surgery. So we've got their online resources be great to have workshops, again, which are either interactive, but at least they're out there, available for people. And I know that different services already have that, some of that stuff anyway. We just need somebody to take control of that and kind of pull it together. So we've got a whole load of resources. And then also we need to decide what needs to be done by whom, really, in terms of health professional skills. And then there are ways of upskilling, you know, upskilling dietitians and um, nutritionists or whoever's working, physios or whoever's working in the bariatric service to do bits and pieces that they can do by running, you know, CPD for people so that they can have the extra up skills that they need, which I think would be a good way forward. Okay, um, and that's our living document there. So you can click on that and you'll find it. Hopefully it still works. It took quite, I'm not very techy, so <laughs> it might not take you there. And that's the publication there, but you can read all the details. So job done. There we are. We were asked to do it and we did it. <laughs> so hopefully it's useful. Shall I take questions or should we? Should we take all the questions right at the end? Okay, do you think? Okay. It's quite a long time till the end, that's all. I just thought it might be. We have far fewer talks than we had before. Yeah. If you'd rather take questions now, then we can do that. I think I'd rather take questions because this is quite specific. So if there's anything now. There probably aren't any, but then if you've, if you've got a. Yes, yeah, can. I want to say, first of all, congratulations because I can only begin to imagine what a tough ask that that really was. But I mean, absolutely well done for taking something because psychology is so, like you say it's a different perspective you have you have some surgeons that like it some go no no just stop just getting patients to but everybody's is one of these everybody's got an opinion on it so mm. I, but for you to actually take all of that and lay what i think 
is an absolutely amazing foundation. I think you're so right about it being advisory as opposed to prescriptive, because I think that invites conversation mm -hmm. and really healthy debate. And I think that's how we can bring this forward. And you know, if you put yourself on the qualitative research, so I like to put myself in different people's shoes to see how they think. And but that's my world. I know no one else thinks like that. But I just think it's amazing what you've done. But I just I love the way you've done it. And just that I think that openness and that leaving it open to debate is a really great thing to do. And just thank mm -hmm. you so much for that. I think it's and a really oh, great tool. It's quite political, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I could sort Brexit now I've done this. <laughs> that's, that's why it's so good. But something that's contentious, the fact that you've hit it head on and you've put something out there, because if we don't have anything to get debate yeah. on, nothing moves forward. But hopefully it hasn't alienated people. That's the thing. That's what I didn't want to do. I, I can't I didn't see want... how it would, but... Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, well, that's right. I didn't. Want, I mean, I think if you become too dogmatic about these yeah. things, you just piss people off, really, don't yeah, you? And absolutely. then they don't engage. So hopefully, it's open enough that we can then absolutely. use it. It will be use. It will be useful. That's all. It's got to be absolutely. useful, is not it? Okay. Okay. I'm done. Right. <laughs> Do you want your... Can I ask one question? Yes, of course you can. It's a very nice presentation, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, from a surgeon's perspective. Um, I mean, as you know, we like cutting, we don't like reading, so <laughs> I've not read those guidelines, but is there... It's one page. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> On the BOMS website, I've reduced it just for you. <laughs> it's got bullet points and it's just a page. <laughs> so is there, is there an absolute contraindication to bariatric surgery, I mean, as far as the, you know, psychological issues are concerned in a bariatric patient. Is, 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 I mean, does that document... Yeah. There's, we, uh, we developed... A yeah, it, uh, there, uh, there is a literature out there. So if you read Stephanie Sogg's, which are the pre-guidelines which were done in America, then they would highlight some things. I think probably suicidality is not good. Uh, drug addiction and alcohol addiction beforehand are not good. So I think, I don't know, there's more people in the room that work in it than me. Eating disorders, I say. So you would say they were absolutely... Yeah, part of the nice guidance. Yeah, okay. So those are the things. And that's what she says in her thing as well. So whether those are things which you just exclude. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can I have a question? Yes, of course you can. Why are you giving this talk to people who probably believe in... Well, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know I was until I turned up. <laughs> I know. I, I was feel like a pause for them and say, oh, yeah. there might be some contraindication. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I know. No, I know. I didn't know I was talking to you. Lots, to be honest. Yeah. They asked. He asked me to come and talk, and I said I'd talk, and then I realised there was two rooms, <laughs> and I'd been marginalised. So no, I shouldn't be in here at all. I should be with the surgeons doing the thing. But then that's why we go to bombs and we have presented yeah. it at bombs. So no, I am talking. I'm, I'm completely aware. I'm preaching to the converted, really. So. So that's all right. But no, I didn't know I was talking in this room. I didn't know there were two rooms. I mean, that's a bit slightly bizarre that there are two rooms, really, isn't it? But anyway, hey, that's the way it goes. Well, I'll raise the white flag. The <laughs> the and hopefully not all surgeons are, there is a fracture, I must fix it. No, no. But we do think there is so much more to the person than just carrying the extra weight. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of hoping my, my in-house psychologist will kind of agree yeah. that we're not all kind of got this Neanderthal mentality. Yeah. I hope. Oh no, I've worked with lots of lovely surgeons. No, absolutely. <laughs> Not all lovely, but lots of them are lovely. The ones I work with are mostly lovely. Well, I'm going to go now before we kind of like, I was doing well. <laughs> let, me get, let me get out. Right, what's it about? Yeah.